Good morning and welcome to the 2022 OEAR Week at Idaho State University and the OEAR Textbook Heroes Speaker Series. Um, please leave your microphones muted during the presentation. There will be uh, time after the speaker's presentation for questions. Uh, you may also post your questions in the chat. Our speaker for today is Mary Von Donzel. She is a clinical associate professor at Idaho State University. Ms. Von Donzel has been a speech language pathologist for over 20 years, working with families and children with communication needs. She has taught several undergraduate courses at Idaho State University and has been the instructor for CSD 3315 clinical processes and pediatrics since 2020. Ms. Von Donzel has generously offered her time today to discuss how she uses OER materials in her CSD 3315 course. Please welcome Mary Von Donzel. Thank you, Mark. See if I can share. And Oh, on that if you have, let me reshare. There we go. So you can see the right one. So my journey did not initially start with OER or even knowing what OER stood for. So this is a little background to give you some information about me. Um, right now, I am a clinical associate professor um, and a speech language pathologist. I teach two courses. I teach CSD 6602, which is a clinical education and training course um, each semester in the fall and the spring. And I work a little bit over the summer to offer um, a same type of course, but with a little bit higher level demand for the graduate students. And I also teach right now CSD 3315, which is the clinical processes in pediatrics. So I am a pediatric speech language pathologist, and really I'm just teaching undergraduate students about um, the process from referral. Once you receive a referral with a client, what do we do with that um, in relation to evaluation and treatment? So originally I am actually from the East Coast. I moved to Idaho in 2011, but I am originally from South Carolina and Virginia both. I've spent half my life in each state until um, probably my late twenties. So I claim both as my homes. I am from divorced parents. My, my parents divorced when I was very young, my mother, um, ended up being a meat wrapper in a grocery store my entire life. And my father is a diesel mechanic in the rural parts of Florida working with farm equipment and machinery. I am a first generation college student in my immediate family and in my um, mother's family. None of her siblings, she comes from a sibling um, a family of five, and so none of her sisters, nor did she ever attend college. And I do have one uncle on my father's side, also a family of five, who attended college. So my journey really begins, I think, when I started college as someone who went to a private woman's college. My mother was very supportive of me going to college, um, and due to her um, marital status of being single and not making a lot of money being on the lower socioeconomic end. I qualified for a lot of grants and some scholarships and a lot of student loans. So when I was in college, used textbooks were available, but even the used textbooks seem to be expensive when you're having to take five or six different courses within a semester. So although not often, or we tried to avoid, sometimes we needed to use credit cards to purchase these books for me for, for the semester, which of course is never a great option because we weren't always able to pay it off at the end of the month, but we're usually able to pay it off by the end of the semester. 
So sometimes we didn't, we would have to buy new books, but in the end, there was really no other choice. You had to buy the textbook because there were no internet options for us in college. Um, we were just getting to use email and begin to explore the World Wide Web. So I took a year off between college and graduate school. And as I started graduate school um, in 1998, I was the second class to graduate. So it was a brand new program. And I was to go for three years um, for three different semesters in the spring and the summer and in the fall. So as a new program, there was really limited options to buy used textbooks. And there's still no internet options. We still didn't use email to communicate with the students during this time. Um, and I remember having to buy not only textbooks that I needed for speech language pathology, but because of the nature of my course um, of study where I worked with PTs and OTs, we took courses for, and I would have to purchase books for those courses that didn't really relate as a whole to things that I would hold on to. It just gave me a little bit more of an interdisciplinary study. So there were pathophysiology books or the most expensive book that I had to purchase was about $150. And it was this little bitty book about medical embryology. And it was an amazing book to have. Um, and I learned so much in that course, but to spend that much money on a little bitty book, I actually held on to that book and still have it in my bookcase because it was the most expensive book at the time that I had purchased for graduate school. So I often was thinking as I began to come into Idaho State University, what happens to those textbooks? Some of them I still have. Some of them I have eventually learned to part with because I didn't use them at all and they just took up space. But even the ones that I still have are out of date and they're not applicable. Um, but they were an investment for me at the time. And so they're kind of hard to throw away because I spent money on them. So now that I'm teaching clinical graduate and undergraduate students, I try to be really aware of the costs of the books that I would like for them to utilize or for them to have. And I think that that's based upon my background um, and knowing the expense of having to buy textbooks where at the time there were not other options for me. So as I think about, do I want to require a textbook for clinical education or what type of textbooks can I require for CSD 3315? My question is always, do I have the students purchase these books or do I not? So there is one book since I've come to graduate school or to Idaho State University that I have continually used throughout my career um, that I would really like for the graduate students to purchase for clinic. And so the clinic director and I had a long discussion about this book is the one that I have is the second edition, but it's the most valuable book that I own. And in my 21 years in my career, this is the book that I have used the most and have also given to my graduate students to use as a resource for their assessments um, or information that they need during their CSD 6602. But currently this book, if we buy it through the publisher is about $170, which just seems like a lot of money for graduate students who are moving here. And especially with the cost of living and everything going up, tuition going up. So what I have done is I tell the students, this is the best book you will ever purchase or um, use in your career. So maybe it's a great idea to use for a gift and request as a gift. If people are asking you, what do you want for graduation or for birthday or for a holiday gift, this is the one you want. Um, so I've tried to use that as an incentive to have them hold on to it. But I've also tried to endeavor, how can I have the graduate students have access to one that's not my book that's out of date um, and so what we have done is we've been able to get the library to purchase this book 
And also the clinic has purchased it as a resource within our clinical resources for graduate students to utilize. Then there are several books in um, 3315 that I have used when I first started teaching. The main textbook is this one over here, Professional Communication and Speech Language Pathology, which is about $95. And because I'm teaching about the clinical process with undergraduate students, I utilize this assessment book a lot because it has a lot of great material that can still be used. And so that's, as again, about 170. And there's just two chapters in this clinical methods book that I just have not been able to find anywhere else that's just really valuable for the students to have. That's a nice way of presenting information. And so that book in and of itself is also 60, about $65. So total, if I used um, or required the students to purchase all of these books, it would cost them about $330, which for an undergraduate course seems rather ridiculous, even for graduate school, but for an undergraduate course, it seems rather ridiculous to have them buy all of these, especially with the off chance that they may not attend graduate school and they're just getting their bachelor's in communication sciences and disorders. So last summer in 2021, I reached out to the ITRC um, and Lisa Kidder. The ITRC is the Instructional Technology Resource Center here at ISU. And I said, I need some assistance in rebuilding my CSD 3315 course. So I enrolled in the Quality Matters Plus program to help get um, assistance and guidance in rebuilding this course because as a speech language pathologist, I never took um, an education course or a course that would teach me how to do this type of rebuilding. So the mentor that I was assigned suggested that I contact the library about OER materials and what type of materials might be available. And I remember saying to him, what is OER? I don't even know what that is. So what are you talking about? And so I learned that it stood for Open Educational Resources. And looking into OER materials really opened my eyes in a variety of ways. So I contacted the Meridian librarian at the time and she did a really thorough job for me looking at what sort of materials were out there. There were no specific OER materials to cover my course that I was teaching. Um, really there's limited options within the field of speech language pathology as a whole but she was able to find a few things here and there that might be beneficial for me, but nothing that we felt was comprehensive. Um, and one of the better resources was not yet available, but would be in the next few years. But really what it did allow me to do in contacting the librarian is to really help me open the door to ideas of what I can do to help minimize the costs for students. And so, the librarian was able to determine different funds that were available through our program. And we were able to order um, through eBooks. We had one of the books already in the library, the assessment and speech pathology book, because I'd requested that for my graduate students. So we were able to purchase the other two books as eBooks. And we were also able to obtain multi-user licensing agreements for those books, which uh, really, to me, opened the door not only for me to use these books within my graduate or my undergraduate course, but also to use these books with my graduate students. There's some great information in the two textbooks that talk about professionalism or how to do family counseling and those sorts of things that would also benefit my graduate students. So I was really excited to be able to say, for this undergraduate course that there is no cost to students without taking away teaching resources and the quality of material. And then I'm the added benefit for me, even though it wasn't um, part of what my original intent was, is that I can really utilize these resources within my clinical education course as well with my graduate students. So really, as I think about um, the OER journey 
and how I feel satisfied that I can benefit some of these students to not have to pay the types of money that I had to pay in either undergraduate or graduate school. I sit here and I think, well, what do I do next in this journey for OER? And one thing that I'm doing is just continuing to look into OER materials. I know that this is a hot topic across the nation and I'm sure the world. And so I know that there's new information coming out all the time related to OER materials, um, updates. I know one of, there was a language book that wasn't available at the time um, this summer, but the instructor and I spoke and she's hoping to have it available within the next couple of years. So it might be that I can use that material for my course as well. Um, I am considering and looking into exploring possible OER creation once I get my course rebuilt um, to not only use for this course itself, but also to use within my clinical education realm as a graduate um, clinical instructor. And then I also want to be able to educate other professors and instructors regarding OER materials and low cost options that would be available to them. I have shared lots of resources that I have found through this journey and I have joined the OER committee here at Idaho State University, which sometimes I'm not always sure how much I add to that because there's not always a lot within my discipline or within the health science field, but I feel like if we can promote the creation of and even just the knowledge about OER materials within our professors that, we're, that I work with that we will be able to have students benefit in the end result as I know the cost of coming into graduate school for multiple years. So we want to try to limit those costs and the long-term effects of um, debt with these students. So for me, the end result of my journey is just that the students benefit, which gives me um, a great sense of well being so that I know that I have helped them. So, um, so that's my journey um, right there. I didn't start out doing OER um, when I was rebuilding my course, really, it just came to me as um, an opportunity, and I've kind of tried to take it and run with it. So, any questions that you all might have? This time, we would like to invite you to ask your questions to our speaker. Uh, you may unmute your microphone to ask the questions, or you may post your questions in the chat. Um, so have you had feedback from students uh, as they've 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 started using your OER materials, right? Yes. What, what have what have your students been saying? The students themselves haven't said anything specific to me yet. Um, I do have one of those. It's just a midterm. So I have a midterm survey out there. And that one of the questions is, how do you like using um, the electronic books through the library or have they had an opportunity? So I don't know the answer to that question quite yet because the survey is still open, so they're not quite done working on it. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, so do you feel like your your work adopting the OER has been, uh, has required a lot of legwork on your own or is it manageable? Like how's that, ex is it extra workload, would you say? It has not been, um, and I'd say that the librarian that helped me, um, it was very easy because I wrote to her and said, my mentor who's helping me create this course said I should write to you and see if there's any OER materials available out there. And she did all the legwork for me. She um, contacted other librarians related to the one OER book that is currently in the midst of creation so that I can have contact with that instructor and that author of that material. Um, and she sent me lists of books. And as she found other opportunities to um, 
even though there wasn't OER material available to me specifically, she said, here's what we can do for you. Um, even though it's not something that's always done due to funds that she knew about that I never even knew about, um, we were able to get these eBooks available for the students to use. So from my end, it was her work and I just needed to figure out how to utilize it. And you are referring to those uh, EISU funds that help support uh, online students? Yes, I okay. believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. it, you, this class that you teach is, is not in person, it's online, is that right? Or Yeah, it's both. Um, it's actually okay. a small part is um, on campus, but the larger portion um, is an online course. So they're from all over the country. Okay, so that your course does qualify for those EISU funds then, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Yeah, so it, in some ways it just allows me to, to know that this information is out there where when, like I said, when I started, I had no idea what OER was. And I have a tendency to be a paper person, not a computer person. And so I didn't even realize that the library had ebooks that you could look at or that there were people creating these other books that you know anybody could use if they needed to so it was a for me an eye-opening experience of well maybe there would be a benefit for me to develop something like that as well for some of the things that I do within the realm of speech language pathology that's not out there right now. Uh and as as you're talking, I'm 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 asking myself. Uh, I'm I'm wondering about the the different platforms that the the ebook is available. Is, do you know much about that? Can the students access those like on a Kindle? The or are they limited to like using a laptop to read it? Or Sandra, you're with the library. Do you know? <laughs> I don't know that question. <laughs> that answer. Yeah, I I am looking at the purchase record for that particular book you pointed out, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, it's an EBSCO ebook, Spencer, which tells you a lot um, about so, accessibility. Is that um, one where you can download a PDF then? Yes. Okay. Um, but it's it also was originally bought as a single user um, mm -hmm. and later upgraded to unlimited use and that that is absolutely critical when you talk about a textbook because I've, I've also had the experience of of a panicked instructor calling me and saying I, I can't get into this one electronic resource we bought for this class and um, we bought we were only able to buy a single user and apparently some student had opened it up and now at that point, no one else could get at it. And we're not able at the library, we don't even host the material. It's remotely hosted. So we're not able to intervene with that and release uh, whoever is using that one user license. So that is, you, you did point that out, Mary, that we, we had unlimited use. And that's mm -hmm. something that has to be stressed. Um, sometimes the, Unlimited user is available. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes yeah. the price of the unlimited user is just not possible for, a, for the library to be able to afford. Um, yeah. And the librarian was really, it was Kristen who's no longer yeah. with us. And, and it was really great because she was, she said, we have this right now. And she asked me a lot of questions about you know, what kind of students would utilize this book? Um, you know, how many, how many students do you think would need to have it open at one time? And she was able to find, and I just lucked out, I think she said, because yeah. the books that I needed were, were nominal really in relation to upgrading to an unlimited user fee. So. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, Mary, I'm I'm also a librarian, and I, I worked with uh, Kristen quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know as much of the ebooks as perhaps I ought to, so I, I'm curious to know sometimes um, if 
with these textbooks, you know, some of the OER textbooks that they have, uh, mm -hmm. students can go to the bookstore and they can get those uh, open educational textbooks printed for 30 or $40, $20 maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if a student did prefer the, the print copy Mm -hmm. uh, with this license, does it allow them to do that? I, I kind of think it wouldn't, but I, I don't. Sandy, do you know? I think it would be, it, it, it's not I terribly feasible so. with this license. I mean, sure, surely a student could print it out themselves on their own printer at home, um, but then you have this loose paper sitting around. And I think the two books that I use, um, the main textbook and then the additional one that I have with two chapters, um, they're not ones that students would hold on to. There's good information as I'm going along teaching for them. It's that assessment book that I tell them, you know, would be useful for them to have. And that one is um, it's like this thick. So for them to print something out, I think would be really hard, even from a bookstore level, because it has so much information about not only pediatrics, but adults and just speech pathology in general. It's a really just useful book. But I feel that when Kristen talked with me, um, as I was trying to figure out how all of this worked, um, that it wasn't something that you could print a whole book that they could download or print certain chapters. I don't know, she didn't talk about going to the bookstore and, and that might just be because I'm in Meridian. And so we don't have access. I don't even know what your bookstore at ISU looks like. So, you know, we don't have access to a bookstore for the students to go down and say, could you print this off for me? Um, so that might not have come up, but I feel like she said, it's not like you could just print the whole book. They would only be able to access certain chapters at a time, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think Spencer, what you're, if you might be referring to something that was in uh, Jeremy's talk. Yeah. Jeremy's talk, yeah. Um, the other day um, through OpenStax, which yeah which is a platform for um, original creations of mm. open educational resources. And they do offer that option <clears throat> where you can request that a hard copy be generated, but that, that's not something that a lot of publishers would do. Yeah, that makes Mary, sense. Uh, Mary, typically how many students do you have in your course? Um, and uh, you know who are benefiting from this free uh, right. free resource? I typically have in my online cohort um, about thirty five to forty, and then on campus um, it depends. This year I only have sixteen on both campuses, um, but typically I would have about twenty to twenty five. We because I teach distance um, for both Meridian and excuse me, Pocatello. And so um, there's usually about 15 between, you know, 10 to 15 on both campuses. So um, overall, it's about 50 students or so that could benefit from this. And I think in my experience with the OER committee that um, I was asked to be on when they started realizing I was doing something with OER in my courses. My department chair asked if I joined the university committee. Um, I'm the representative for the Kosiska's Division of Health Sciences. And really what I'm learning is that not just for me, but across the board within the field of healthcare, the options for OER, whether that's at an undergraduate level or at the graduate level is really limited. So a lot of times I'll sit in the meetings and listen to Jeremy talk about how, you know, he's done all of this um, OER use through OpenStax and whatnot. And I'm like, doesn't, doesn't qualify for us, but if we can educate 
um, about not only the information is out there, here's who you contact to get that information that does the work for you and they give you a list and then you just have to go through and look. Um, that's fairly easy for us when we're doing a lot, um, but also it's an opportunity to create something um, which could go towards your help with promotion, um, whether it's a clinical faculty or you know an academic person. So for me, I've kind of in, embraced this as an educational opportunity as well for other professions where you know we all have, most all of us have student loans because we went to school forever and I didn't even get my PhD. So, you know, we have, I think we all have a tie into helping decrease the cost as a whole. So, so I'm guessing, Mary, that we would be able to count you among our library supporters who would push for continued support of the library budget. Yes. <laughs> yes, because that's, I mean, that's a big thing when we talk as professors, you know, well, we, I mean, everybody's stretched thin, but like, how much time does this take me to look into this? And where do I even start? Because we know where to find the research articles, but where do I find this kind of stuff? And I said, oh no, I just contacted Kristen. <laughs> she did it all for me. So, you know, from my standpoint, I didn't even realize that the librarians could do that. So some of it I think too is, you know, having a librarian here in Meridian is still rather new for us. And so being able to develop that relationship and realize what is available to us and, and what sort of things that you all do, you know, in the library that can help support us as well, um, I think is an important part of this for sure. It's certainly becoming clear every day that this is really discipline specific. Um, mm -hmm. For sociology, for Jeremy's talk the other day, there already exist um, original creations that are openly licensed and people can um, just utilize them once they know about them. And in, in your profession, there don't exist these yet. They're, they're in the works. Um, Right. You have to realize that. And I think one of the difficult parts, and you know, this is part of that journey for me this year, is that um, you know, the State Board of Education is offering, you know, these grants. And even with ISU, we're offering these grants to utilize those, but they don't qualify for us because we don't teach general education courses. Ours are very specified and even I do have one course and I used to be the professor I'm not the professor of it anymore that um, it's our introduction to the communication professions and that course did not have a textbook so it would be considered an OER um, an OER course and it's mainly an intro course for people who are just coming into our discipline and some of the books that we were able to find, like the eBooks would be appropriate, but there still wasn't a lot of OER that would fit that, like, you know, an open stacks or anything that would fit our discipline. So yeah. I think it is difficult to kind of encourage to where, you know, other places are able to get grants and funding because their general education um, being more specific in our discipline and graduate level and those sorts of things. Yeah. I'm finding frustration and I would love to do this, but I need some help and or release time or something. And it's hard to find those opportunities because I don't teach those general education courses. Well, I guess too, when, when I appointed this committee in the beginning, um, I deliberately called it the OAER committee because um, uh, to acknowledge that there are some that there are some that are not openly licensed, but that we are able to manage to um, acquire affordable mm -hmm. access, and that, that's what I, I call this one we're talking about: the year yeah. assessment in speech language pathology is not openly licensed. Right. And uh, it's technically it's OAER, but yeah. that fine point, you know, doesn't come up a lot, but I think that's, it's 
useful to have that deeper understanding that, that mm -hmm. it's really broad. Um, like in your profession, there's not, not a whole lot yet. It's just emerging still. Right. I right. think that's likely true about other health professions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I did know Kristen was really good at sharing that it technically wasn't OER. Um, so when she shared this, you know, award with me as a textbook hero, I thought, I thought you said it really wasn't OER. She says it's not, but it's, you know, yeah, but it, that it's affordability. And you were, you know, we did the work to try to figure yeah, it out. So, right, right. It's um, But, you know, there are things I know that there are other um, people within our healthcare field that, you know, just like with me in graduate school, the books are so expensive. And they're like, why do I even want to purchase that book? Um, you know, and sometimes the professors will say, yeah, you can use older editions because you can find them for a lot cheaper. But sometimes, especially with research and things like that, like even my textbooks that I go to look at from a research standpoint, they're no longer even valid because some of it's yeah. not true anymore. <laughs> so it makes it tricky to be able to go back too far with some of those editions as well. Okay, um, I would like to uh, thank our speaker today, Professor Mary Van Donzel, for sharing her journey and experience with OAER course materials. And thank you all for joining us today um, for the 2022 OAER week um, and the Textbook Heroes presentation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.